she believed in me and that made all the difference. I was sitting in the spaceship ready for takeoff. The countdown had begun and I was looking forward to being the youngest human ever in space. I was five years old and I was at my grandparents for the weekend. My grandfather, a Methodist minister, was at work and I was at home in the parsonage with my grandmother, Grandma Gibbs. I rustled around in the basement and I found a great big box that would serve as the fuselage for my rocket. I folded out two flaps for the wings, one in the back for the tail, one I folded in and then penciled in on the dashboard all of the circuitry that would be necessary. To the side of the fuselage, I nailed two tin cans for the rockets and I stuffed them full with toilet paper and with paper towels as fuel. And then I remembered that although I was going to be the first human in space, I still wasn't allowed at five years old to light a match. And so I trudged into the parsonage, found my grandmother washing dishes, and I told her my dilemma. I was headed to space, but I needed her to light my rockets. I didn't expect her to play along. I, of course, she would say, what would your mother say if I let you go into space alone? But I was quite surprised that she picked up a book of matches and she followed me out to the rocket ship. So I climbed in and I started the countdown again. 10, 9, 8, 7. And to my astonishment, my grandmother lit the match. 5, 4, 3. And I said, wait, stop. My grandmother stopped dutifully. I realized that these rockets on the side of my ship would propel me forward before I would get lift off and I hadn't put wheels on my rocket. I knew that the friction would cause me to go slower and probably not allow me to even get off the ground, let alone go into space. So I aborted the countdown. I said, Grandma, go back in, let me get some wheels. I went and searched in her basement for roller skates or some kind of wheels from a dolly or something. Couldn't find any, got distracted, and pretty soon I'd forgotten about the rocket ship and never went back to it. But a few weeks later, I was older and wiser. I realized that that rocket ship would never get off the ground with toilet paper and paper towels for fuel. And I thought, how sad. My poor grandmother, she actually believed that that thing was going to take off. And I felt sorry for her. My grandmother's not the brightest bulb on the tree, I thought. But then I grew older and a couple of years later, I realized my grandmother was smart. And what she did was she lit a match in order to fuel a young boy's dreams. She was smart and she believed in me. My question for you is, who did that for you? On Mother's Day, probably most of us could say, well, mom sure believed in me when nobody did. All of us have had a cheerleader that have helped bring us where we are. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was a friend. I see something in you. Maybe you could do that. Maybe it was a, a, a pastor. Maybe it was a father, a grandfather, an uncle. Grandma Gibbs was the one who helped launch me into life. And I know for every person who is gets ahead in life. There's someone behind the scenes who encouraged them, a cheerleader. For the Apostle Paul, it was a man virtually unknown. His name was Ananias. Ananias is introduced to us in Acts chapter 9, our text for today. You see, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. He's not an apostle, not one of the 12, he's just an everyday, ordinary guy like us. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, 
He said, like Samuel, the little boy said, Here am I, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight. God gave him directions. This was one of the few streets that was straight in those days. I've been to this street. And he said, There inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. So Saul of Tarsus is a persecutor of the church, an enemy of the cross. But notice what Jesus sees in him. Jesus sees where he is now, not what he's done. He's looking at his present. He says he is praying. Isn't that just like Jesus, right? So the Lord continues in verse 12. He says, in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias. I gave him a vision of you. And Ananias goes, oh, great, thanks a lot. He'll be expecting you. Oh, great, no pressure. I, he's, I want you to put your hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Oh, no pressure. I'm going to see an enemy of the cross who wants to kill Christians. And you want me to heal him? Lord, I don't have the gift of healing. His natural reaction in verse 13 is, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Everybody's talking. Everybody is talking. And if you listen to them, you might not do anything. He's done much damage to those saints in Jerusalem. This is the first time Christians are called saints. The rest of the New Testament, it's everyday Christians like us who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus who are called saints, not super saints who are dead. No, we are called saints. And then he continues, here, right here, he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. He's got a warrant out for arrest. He's coming to get us. And you want me to go to him? But the Lord continued in verse 15. And he said, go, there it is, one word, great commission. Go, and he is a chosen vessel of mine. You know what a vessel is, right? That box that I got in, that's a vessel. A gallon of milk. Milk is great, but without a vessel, the milk spills everywhere. It's not the out cardboard box we're concerned about. We're concerned about the milk inside. But to get the milk home, you need a vessel. Well, that's what Jesus says. Paul He's not all that, but he is a vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles. God has a sense of humor. Paul is a Jewish fanatic. He doesn't like Gentiles. God's going to choose him to send to Gentiles for the rest of his life. And to the children of Israel, too. I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, he has learned about you before I came and called you. But here's the good news, Ananias. I know his, I'm going to tell you his future before he even knows what his job is. And his job is going to be to suffer for my name's sake. He's not going to persecute you. He's going to spend the rest of his life being persecuted for me. But unlike Jonah, who went running the other way, notice in verse 17 what Ananias did. Ananias went his way. And he entered the house and laying his hands on him, not grabbing him by the collar, but laying his hands on him, like in Acts chapter 6 when they laid hands to anoint these first apostles. And he said, notice the first word out of his mouth, Brother Saul, don't you know those are music to the ears of Saul? Here's Saul's dilemma. Saul had been a zealous Jew, a Pharisee, and he was persecuting Christians. So he had friends among the Jews and enemies among the Christians. But now Christ met him, appeared to him on the Damascus Road. He's become a convert to Christianity, and he has now joined the church, but they won't have anything to do with him. But because he's joined the church, the Jews won't have anything to do with him. He's a man without a country. Nobody wants anything to do with him, especially the Christians who think he's going to kill him. So for him to hear this word, Brother Saul, wow, someone believes in me. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came. Notice what he says. 
I believe you. No one else believes you that Jesus appeared to you. I believe you. He has sent me that you may receive your sight. Oh boy, he promises him before he can deliver. And more importantly, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he told me you'd be expecting me. Here I am. So he lays hands on him. And in verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. And when he received food, he was strengthened. Wow, healed, filled, baptized, strengthened, accepted, believed. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Imagine this scene. Ananias has to bring in Saul of Tarsus to the church. And they all say, oh no, that's the guy who's not his picture on our wanted poster. We're on his wanted poster. Why are you bringing him here? The rest of Saul's story, we know. But Ananias' story, this is the last we hear of him. This is the last we see from him. He disappears from the pages of history and scripture, except he's mentioned glowingly by Paul in chapter 22. But you know what? Because of Ananias, Paul was able to write all those letters that now make up much of our New Testament, was able to lead all those souls to Christ, was able to plant all those churches. And you know what? Ananias gets some credit for that. So I want to ask you, who was the Ananias in your life? Who believed in you? Who was the Grandma Gibbs in your life? And who can you be Ananias to? I know we all want an Ananias to come and tell us how wonderful we are. But the call this morning on Mother's Day is, who can you and I be an Ananias to this week? Someone who desperately needs someone to call them brother or sister, to believe in them. I want to challenge each of us today to learn a lesson from mothers and be an Ananias. How can we come to believe in someone? We fear if we believe in them, they will let us down. We're afraid to commit ourselves to them. And there are hundreds of ways we show them that we don't believe in them. Yeah, trust everyone and cut the cards. So how can we come to believe in someone that really, if we're honest, we don't believe? Maybe it's not our child. How did Ananias come to believe in Saul? Let's just look at the text and see what he did to come to believe in him. Notice the first thing that we saw in verse 11 is what Jesus saw in Saul. He didn't see him as the persecutor. He didn't see his past. He saw him praying. Imagine a militant atheist today. If you're my age, maybe you remember Madeline Murray O'Hare. But put a gun in Madeline Murray O's Hare's hand and not just trying to get prayer out of the schools but trying to get Christians out of the living and then you see them praying what if it was a gangster what if it was a capo the godfather of a, a crime family what if it was an addict what if it was a grump you know what do we have to do to see potential in them and begin to believe in them my trick when someone is mean and awful to me, usually in traffic, they honk the horn. As soon as the light turns green, I haven't even had a chance to pull up. I don't hate them. I don't salute them with one of my fingers. I just think, I'm glad I'm not them. I don't have to be with them all day. But that's not enough. What, if, what do I got to do to believe in them? How did our missionaries come to believe in those people that they've given their life away to go to some foreign field and to serve. Well, maybe they start to see them as God sees them. Here's a prayer that God delights to answer. If you say, God, help me see so-and-so through your eyes today, this is not one where he has to think about it. This is one he wants to answer. God, let me see them through your eyes. Not only that, but notice he sees him as he really is. 
he doesn't just see what he can be in God's eyes, he also sees where he really is. So he's being realistic. He's not romanticizing, oh, this guy's perfect. He's not perfect. As a matter of fact, he's got a shady past. He's not going to be disillusioned. Yes, he says, I know about this guy. I've heard many things about him. If you don't take it realistically, you might become a quitter. Many missionaries, many pastors come home disillusioned because the first time they share the gospel, someone slams the door in their face. People don't say thank you. Maybe they even hate you. But what we need to do is we need to get over that and we just need to see them as they really are, someone who needs Jesus. Forgive them for acting like someone who needs Jesus. And third, we can do what Ananias did. We can see them as God can make them, not just as God sees them now and what they used to be, but see them as God can make them. God says, he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, the children of Israel. He must suffer for my name's sake. God delights in revealing to us answers to prayer. Like, God, show me what they could be. There's a terrible comedy called Airplane where this recurring character, Johnny, runs around and he's always got these smart quips. If you've ever seen it, you can't forget Johnny. What can you make of this? And he says, oh, I can make origami. But I never get that question when someone hands him a piece of paper and says, what can you make of this? Well, he could make a butterfly or something, but when I hand God my life, what can God make of this? So I ask God, what can you make of their life? And here is what God says, I'm going to do something in his life. We have a um, second part to the story of Grandma Gibbs. 30 years later, Grandma Gibbs is on the left there. Grandma Hartman, my paternal grandmother, is in the middle. I was 35 years old. I was 10 years into my first pastorate. And I, the church grew to the point where I needed a secretary. We could afford a full-time secretary. Well, the first person I thought to hire was my grandmother, Grandma Gibbs. She was a pastor's wife, now a widow. She knew what it was like to be in a parsonage. And she loved her grandson. I knew she would protect me. And she was old enough to be my grandmother, which she was, so no one would ever accuse me of having an affair with my secretary. And so I hired my grandmother, and it was a joy because every day I could hear her humming the hymns and singing the hymns all day. What a testimony she was to me. But one day when I was 35, as her grandson and her boss, I used to brag, I'm the only guy in town who kisses his wife goodbye in the morning, kisses his secretary hello, and they both know about it, and they're both okay with it. It was great. But one day she said, Jeff, I want to take you to lunch. I got to have a talk with you. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. After lunch, she said, I guess you want to know what I want to talk to you about. I was wondering if she had to quit or something. She said, Jeff, I remember 10 years ago when you graduated from college, how you dreamed of going to the Ivy League and you applied to Harvard and they turned you down. And I said, yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. She goes, you know, your grandfather, my husband, the pastor, always regretted not finishing his education. So let your grandmother, not your secretary, but your grandmother give you a swift kick in the seat of the pants and you need to get back to school and don't make the mistake your grandfather did. Complete your education. My grandmother got my attention. So I applied. I didn't have the nerve to apply to Harvard again, so I chose a lesser school. I applied to Princeton. It was closer and to my astonishment, they accepted me and when I finished my first master's degree I tried another school it wasn't Harvard but it was close it was in Connecticut it's called Yale and they took me and there I completed my second master's degree finally I had enough nerve to apply a second time to Harvard and they accepted me and here you see my graduation picture with my two grandmothers in 2001 when because my grandmother kicked me in the seat of the pants, I decided I better start thinking about going back to school. 
you know, I did all the work, wrote all the papers, she didn't type them for me. I got the diploma, but my grandmother gets credit for that because she was my Ananias. And this is the proud day when she got to see her grandson. I wasn't complete yet. She didn't get to see me go do PhD work, but this was the day that she dreamed about for me. And so how can we start to believe in somebody? Well, see them as God sees them, see them as they really are, and then see what God can make of them. But the practical question we have to ask is, how can I be like Ananias? How can I be like Grandma Gibbs? How can I tell someone I believe in them? Well, it's pretty easy. I believe in you. It's not too hard. What did Ananias do next? Well, I want you to see in the story, Ananias went his way and he entered the house. He listened to God. He went. We need to listen. We need to go. And then more than that, we need to draw near and we need to sit down and spend some time with them. Lord, you don't know what they're like. You want me to go where? You want me to talk to who? But Lord, they smoke and they drink and they curse. And the Lord says, imagine that, someone who doesn't know the Lord, acting like someone who doesn't know the Lord. The Lord says, I believe in them. Can you believe in them? Okay, you show them you believe in them by going to them. Going on a mission trip is telling not only I believe in the Lord, but believing in the people that you go to share the gospel with. And then he did something very important. He touched him. He laid his hands on him in an appropriate way, not an inappropriate touch, but he went and he touched him. There was a point of contact. Sometimes it's literal. You touch them. Sometimes you can't, but you look for some kind of connection. If you're talking to someone who's a stranger, you may not lay your hands on them. As a chaplain, I prayed for many years with strangers, 10, 15, 20 people a day in the hospital. And I would, if they would allow me, I would take their hand, lay the hand on a shoulder. And doctors have done studies. They found that there is a healing virtue in human touch. We know that. If you can't touch someone, we need to find common ground to talk to them. But the point is, what we need to do is we need to find a way to touch them as Ananias did with Paul. When I went on a mission trip to Brazil, right next to our tent where we were having VBS for this tribe of native South Americans who'd never seen a Westerner before, never heard the gospel, the witch doctor came and set up his tent right next to ours and performed rituals to pray for the demons to battle us. But after a couple of days of prayer, tragedy struck his family and his wife passed away. And he laid her body out right next to our tent where we could see her. And I saw that as an opportunity maybe to reach out to this man. When I went to talk to him through two translators, one into Portuguese and then from the Portuguese into this dialect, the translator said, don't touch him. He's full of demons. And I said in English, I'm okay. Greater is he that is in me than he's in the world. And when I went up to this witch doctor, he came up to about here on me. And I told him, first in English, then Portuguese, and then his dialect, I'm so sorry for your loss, which I was. And then I just reached out to maybe give him a hug. And he hugged me and wouldn't let go. And it made a difference in his life that someone who believed in God would believe in him and hug him. I can't say that he came to know Christ that week but he was moved because someone not only went to speak with him, but even just touched to him. Earn the right to speak to somebody by going and finding a point of contact. And then remember what Ananias did that made such a difference for Saul. Remember the first word out of his mouth was brother. And so what we want to do is call them brother or sister. Now they may not be a brother or sister in Christ yet, but you might find a way to tell somebody that they are meaningful. Maybe he gave him more than just physical sight. <clears throat> Maybe he gave him spiritual sight. We just have to find a way to tell them that we believe in them. 
they might object. Oh, I believe in God, but I don't know that he believes in me. You know what that person needs? They need someone who loves God to believe in them. There are some people out there who believe in God but are not believers. They don't think God believes in them. What they need is someone to believe in them. Think about it. Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road. But that wasn't enough. He needed Ananias to come and lay hands on him and accept him. He knew Jesus loved him and died for him. He needed someone tangible. Great story. I might have told it already. A little boy was scared by the thunderstorm and he called into his mother and father's room and said, someone come in here and hold my hand. I'm scared. Dad said, we're right here. Jesus is with you in there. We'll pray for you. The little boy cried back, I want somebody in here with skin on. Isn't that what some people need? They know God loves them, but they need to have someone with skin on show them some love. So it's not enough for Saul just to have Jesus. God sent Ananias to complete the work. Isn't that amazing? The truth is, we don't just tell them to believe in Jesus. We need to tell them that we believe in them. We need to do it and then we need to say it. Don't just tell them you believe in Jesus, but tell them you believe in them. We can say, come to our service, and we can tell them we love them, but the point is we have to do more than just say Jesus loves you. We have to love them. That's the, here comes the exciting part though. What happens when we tell someone that we believe in them? What happens When you go on a mission trip, when you go across the street and talk to somebody about Jesus, what happened when Ananias believed in Saul? Well, the first thing that happens to them is they begin to see. Paul literally regained his sight. He was blinded on the road to Damascus. Jesus blinded him. Ananias, humanly speaking, opened his eyes. Saul quite literally began to see, but there is a way in which all of us need to begin to see ourselves and life in a new way. We all have blind spots, right? Some are negative, some are positive. But the truth is, we need someone to help us see ourselves sometime. Yeah, Grandma, you're right. I do need to finish my education. Yeah, you're right. Maybe I should try out for the team. Maybe I should apply to that school. And then they begin not only to see, but they begin to believe. There fell from his eyes something like scales, and he arose and was baptized. If you tell someone God believes in them enough to die, and you show them you believe enough in them to go, maybe they will begin to believe because we say seeing is believing, right? And Ananias does the most important thing here. As I said earlier, he not only says, I believe in you, but he goes and he introduces him to everybody in the church and he makes him a part of the family. So when we reach out and touch someone, call them brother or sister, we make them a part of the family. They accept him because Ananias says, it's all right, he's with me. So here is my question for you. Who believed in you? For most of us, mom certainly did. You brought home something, you scribbled in school, and you showed it to her, and she said, oh, that's wonderful. It may have been the worst drawing in the whole class, but your mom believed in you. Maybe for you it was someone else. Maybe it was a grandmother. You know, I got to tell you something I learned this year. I couldn't wait for Mother's Day to share this new thing I learned this year. I learned that a female human being develops all of the eggs she will have her entire life, not when she's born, but before she is born, when she is four months in her mother's womb. Now, males, they don't produce sperm until puberty, and then they produce millions every day. But females get a very limited amount of eggs, 
that will last them their entire life while they are in their mother's womb. Now, this is just going to blow your mind. That means that you and I, every one of us, began our cellular life, our separate biological existence, not in the womb of our mother, but in the womb of our maternal grandmother. For me, it was Grandma Gibbs. I wasn't, I wasn't beginning in 1959. I was actually conceived in 1958. But my cellular life began in 1937 in the womb of Grandma Gibbs. And not only did she give me the gift of a mom, my mom led me to Jesus, but she also, in her womb, my life began. Isn't that amazing? What does that tell us about the power of grandmothers as well as mothers? But here's the point. You see, when you become Ananias to somebody else, Ananias believed in Paul, and Paul believed in Timothy. Second Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and says, the things that I've taught you, you go and teach others also, that they may teach others. And it keeps on going. And so if you give life to somebody else, they turn around and give life to somebody else, it just keeps on going. That's what motherhood is. That's what grandmothering is. So who lit a fire underneath you? Who can you light a fire underneath that they might turn around and light a fire under someone else and keep the chain going? Part three of Grandma Gibbs' story, one year after that graduation at Harvard, my grandmother went to be with the Lord, and I had the privilege of doing her funeral. And at her funeral, I told the story of a five-year-old boy in a stupid little paper box rocket and how she lit a match for a little boy's dreams. And then I told how 30 years later, she had lit a fire underneath me figuratively and encouraged me to go do what I should have done all along. So there in the pulpit with her in a box, a wood box, that wasn't like my cardboard box. This one was taking her to heaven. I lit a match. And I said, I thank God for my grandma Gibbs who lit a fire underneath me, literally and figurative. And I encourage them to remember the one who was a cheerleader for them. But I encourage them to do what I learned from my grandmother. I want to spend the rest of my life being an encourager from the pulpit and everywhere I go to help people know that Jesus believes in them and I do. And you know what I learned from my grandmother? I learned that you can't push someone uphill without rising yourself. When you lift someone else up, you actually go uphill with them. I've told this story at my grandmother's funeral and now I tell you today because I want you to be like her. I want you to be like him, Ananias. And this week, light a fire for somebody else. Tell them you believe in them. Show them you believe in them. And then step back and watch the difference that Jesus can make. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our mothers. I thank you for my mother who will be with us next Sunday. I thank you for my grandmother who I will see someday in heaven. Lord, I thank you for those who believed in each one of these people here today. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be grateful for those who've made a difference, who've been encouragers for us. But Lord, I pray that more than that, we would pass the torch by lighting the way for somebody else. Lord, please make a difference in us and then please make a difference through us in others. Lord, if there's someone here today who's never trusted in Christ as their savior, I pray that today, right now where they're seated, they might accept this gift of salvation that you've provided through the blood of your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray that they'd come to an end of themselves, repent of their sins, and trust in you and your death for their salvation by saying something like this to you and meaning it. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. But I thank you for believing in me and dying for me. I believe in you, that you died for me. Come into my heart, my life, forgive my sins, for Jesus' sake.
With your head still bowed, if you prayed that prayer, can I pray for you? Would you let me have that privilege? You can check off the first box at the bottom of that attendance sheet, put it in the offering plate, hand it to me. If you didn't pray that prayer and you need to, would you settle it before you leave today? For every one of us who knows Jesus, who knows that Jesus believes in us, can I encourage you, can I plead with you to be an Ananias this week to one person? Find some, ask God right now for someone. God will lay someone on your heart, I know it. The Holy Spirit will just instantly bring someone to your mind. Lord, help us to be Ananias to someone this week. Maybe someone who doesn't know Jesus. Maybe someone who's just discouraged. Lord, help us to believe in them. And Lord, help us to believe in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.